Thank you, Betsy, for that uh, very, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, so good evening, uh, everyone. I would like to thank Truman State University for giving me the opportunity to complete my work that has been on my mind for several years now. I would like to thank uh, Dean O'Donnell of the School of Arts and Letters for his support, and especially Dr. Roy Scalarud, Chair of the Department of English and Linguistics, for encouraging me to apply for a sabbatical. I thank Dr. Mark Becker, Chair of the Global Issues Colloquium Committee, for inviting me to present my sabbatical work in the Global Issues Colloquium. And last but not the least, I thank Taylor Libert for all her work as a Global Issues Colloquium intern, and most of all, for listening to me so patiently and producing a stunning poster for this event. And if you haven't seen it, and uh, you know, here is the poster. It says, the world is full of paper, write to me. I happen to have the vantage point of looking at Aga Shahid Ali's work as someone acquainted with post-colonial literature and the added advantage of being his sister. Before he died in 2001, he established the Aga Shahid Ali Literary Trust, to which he appointed me as one of the trustees. Since then, I have been in a position to see the magnitude and the variety of work that has been done on Shahid. I also happen to be one of the directors of the Digital Humanities Project at Hamilton College, where they have a Mellon-funded digital archive of the videotaped recordings, personal documents, letters, and manuscripts of Shahid. Shahid, particularly after his death, has been owned as a poet of India, and more especially as the voice of Kashmir. I do want to talk a little bit about the art based on his work. The Israeli-American artist Ishar Patkin's art shows, uh, inspired by Shahid's Rooms Are Never Finished, which was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2001. They have been shown worldwide in South America, in Israel, and of the many locations in the US at the Mass MoCA, the Massachusetts <coughs> Museum of Con Contemporary Art, that's in North Adams, Massachusetts. Another artist, Nilima Sheikh's uh, work has been shown in Athens, Germany, and the Art Institute of Chicago, and where the title of her show uh, is more explicitly tied to Shahid, each night put Kashmir in your dreams, a line she has taken from the poem, I see Kashmir from New Delhi at midnight. The third artist I want to mention is Masood Hussain, who is from Kashmir. Shahid actually gave him seven couplets in 1999, and in fact there was what has been called a tsunami-like flood on the 7th of September in 2014 in Kashmir. Uh, it destroyed much of Kashmir, and Masood Hussain saved these by tying them to the beams of his roof. Uh, so I thought that was, that was interesting to share with you. So for me, uh, it is fascinating that Shahid's work has made it uh, to stage and film, and at, at, the, at the current moment presently, the Film Institute of India is producing a film called Rizwan, which is based on a character in one of his poems. Uh, so that's ongoing. The, the trailer or preview is already out there. So it is difficult to encapsulate the breadth and impact of his work in 45 uh, to 60 minutes. I will do my best. Um, much of what I am going to share are a few vignettes with you. And I hope what I have chosen will convey how Shahid brought to our attention not only a global perspective on poetic language and forms, but also a profound respect for poetry's importance in the world. Uh, and I also have to make a confession 
that I have really never done a PowerPoint presentation, so I was helped with this. But I, I am saying that I am a little challenged, so to synchronize my, you know, 50 to 60 pages of written TypeScript with that is going to be not terribly easy. But I do want to say that when I was asked by uh, Taylor about what kind of poster did I have suggestions, so I remembered that the, in, in this uh, earlier this uh, in the summer, uh, my daughter uh, sent me an email saying that a friend of hers from school, uh, in my daughter lives in London, had uh, seen this and took this picture of uh, of this poem stationery uh, in the London Underground, and this is the second time actually it has uh, been there. So I thought that it would be nice to include the last two lines of the poem, the world is full of paper, write to me, and that's from stationery. And this is the poem, uh, the moon did not become the sun, it just fell on the desert in great sheets, reams of silver handmade by you. The night is your cottage industry now, the day is your brisk emporium. The world is full of paper, right to me. So this is uh, uh, very uh, generally the organization of my talk, uh, a little bit, but I may not go exactly in that order, so I'm going to beg your forgiveness. But aesthetics and form, history and memory, intellectual, cosmopolitan upbringing, Kashmir, exile, and the uh, ghazal. So, uh, he always said that first and foremost, he was a poet in the English language. Uh, he wrote exclusively in English, calling it his first language. And uh, he also said, I do consider English in many ways a South Asian language. So, Shahid uh, was born in 1949 and he died in 2001. Uh, critically acclaimed uh, both in America and internationally, and his work has been translated into several languages, including Italian, Hebrew, Kashmiri, and Urdu. Uh, and as I just read, he was very clear about his identity as a poet. Describing his voice as deeply rooted and yet cosmopolitan, he considered himself first and foremost a poet in the English language. He underscored that he, quote, under, owned three major world cultures, Hindu, Muslim, and Western, without effort. And as he grew up with them, he felt these three were, as he put it, a part of his mental and emotional makeup. He said, quote, I can use the Indian landscape and the subcontinent's myths and legends and history from within. And I can do so for the first time in what may, might seem like a new idiom, a new language, subcontinental English. And for those of us who have read Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, we are aware of that a little bit. Shahid pointed out that in India, he made his case by making one for all South Asian writers in English, that they all are privy to triple or more mixes which they can exploit from within, the way the spirit of Urdu weaves itself into his English. Without the desire to represent India to the West, he could write in English with an inwardness about the immense resource that the subcontinent offered. Growing up speaking English and Urdu and hearing Hindi, Punjabi, and Kashmiri, he just assumed that cosmopolitanism was the way to be. The accidents of history, Shahid said, had put him in the enviable situation of contributing simultaneously to three traditions, the new Anglophone literatures of the world, the new subcontinental literatures in English, and the new multi-ethnic literatures of the United States. I thoroughly enjoy being a poet. This is quintessential Shahid. He loved 
being a poet and lived as a poet and did it splendidly. As a poet, he kept returning to form and images, to themes and words, to Kashmir, loss, and longing. But it was the work, the getting it down on paper every day that mattered to him. For Shahid, writing a poem was a conscious process and a mysterious process. Simultaneously, a phrase or a sentence would become so very insistent at a certain point that it wouldn't let go. Sometimes a word would haunt him and trigger the beginnings of a poem. I recall once in Amherst, I was up early and saw that his light was on. He had been up all night working on the line, on one line of a poem. One quality that defined a poem for Shahid was ambiguity, negative capability. He said, I hope a poem is never completely understood, that it keeps suggesting possibilities of interpretation. If a poem can be exhausted, then to me it ceases to be a poem, and it must keep suggesting. His interviews, like his poetry readings, were opportunities for him to perform. He loved people, and especially the audiences at his readings. A 1998 interview in India reveals an exuberant Shahid with three works in progress under his belt. An anthology of ghazals he was editing, Ravishing Disunities, Real Ghazals in English. His own book of ghazals, Call Me Ishmael Tonight, and what was to be his last poetry collection, Rooms Are Never Finished and the knowledge that an Indian edition of his collected poems was on its way. I've just written a poem in suffix, he remarked. It was a real challenge. The line goes, the lines go like this, trochee, 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 dactyl trochee. It was a real challenge, but I did it. Because strict forms allowed him more discoveries, he decided to write a canzone a specific form that's supposed to be invented by Dante. Only seven poets, he added, had written one canzone each, and hence he was possibly the only one who had done two canzones. This is at that time. Um, I love coming up with good lines before he tells the story of Barcelona Airport to the interviewer. Um, I was bored, this is uh, at the Barcelona airport, and he is stopped by the airport security woman, so a quote. I was bored, which is worse than getting irritated, and I get into an impish mood when that happens. So when she asked, are you carrying anything that might be dangerous for other passengers, I looked straight at her and replied, just my heart. He admired wit and repartee and perfected the art in his own performance as a poet. He always knew that he was going to be a poet, and looking back, he realized that he had always been sensitive to language, to how words sounded, to their music. I mean, a word or phrase would captivate him. While Shahid write, started writing poems when he was around 10 or 11, it was in his late teens that he was to develop a critical awareness of his medium. His youthful poetry from the point of view of maturity, both of thought and emotion, was lacking. And as, as, a, as Shahid said in retrospect, did not reflect an awareness of prosody. Two things happened that were to play a critical role in forming his attitude and start his poetic transformation. The first was a personalized letter of rejection Shahid received when he was 18, his first crushing rejection from Quest, a leading English literary journal in India. To quote Shahid, the editor, after a year of tolerating his submissions, wrote, please do not send us any more poems. They are far below our standard. Instead of being faced by that letter of rejection, he reworked his poem, and two years later, later the same editor took it. That rejection forced him to become self-conscious about his poetry as art, and discovered that there was something called standards. Subsequently, Shahid's father presented him a leather-bound notebook, which he inscribed, quote, another notebook for the same game, 
spontaneous self-expression must now grow into studied attempts at conciseness and discipline. The impact of both the editor's rejection and his father's inscription made Shahid aware that there was such a thing as discipline, that there was such a thing as studied attempts. His various hyphenated identities, Kashmiri American poet, Indian American poet, South Asian American poet, Muslim American poet, would be true, he said, in one way or the other. And if they are used in larger ways, he didn't have an objection to them. But he said if they are used simply to restrict him, he was not interested. The conscious identity scripts Shahid wrote for himself <coughs> were driven by his desire for an identity as a poet. When he would talk about himself to strangers, to students, to peers, his scripts were funny, elegant, imaginative, unusual, and captivating. He said, I'm not interested in my life for the sake of my poetry, meaning my life as autobiography. I'm interested in my autobiography to the extent it helps me to illuminate my concerns, my themes. His poetic roots embedded in his exposure since childhood to art in all its forms brought to his poetry his unique signature. In his narrative statement for the Guggenheim, he wrote, quote, poetry was part of the air we breathed in our home in Kashmir. My grandmother and my parents quoted poetry on the spur of any moment, reciting entire passages in English, Shakespeare, the Romantics, Shelley, Keats especially, Hardy, Persian, Hafiz, Rumi, Saadi, Firdos, and Urdu, Ghalid, Faiz, Mir, and, in Kash and the Kashmiri <coughs> poets are Mahjur and Habba Khatun. I mentioned the canzone that, that he talked about. Uh, Anthony Hecht uh, said, having used the form himself, he could easily understand why no one had been tempted to write more than one. And this is uh, what he said later. Hecht said he had spoken too soon, because shortly before his death, Shahid sent him a third poem of his in the same form, which in his view makes him its indisputable master. Um, Shahid, a cosmopolitan at heart, was very clear about his identity as a poet. He wrote exclusively in English, calling it his first language, even though formally Urdu would be considered his mother tongue. Uh, and as I had in the quote uh, before this, he said it was not a choice. Because you know, people I ask, well, you know, what made him decide to to write in English? Well, India being under British colonial rule definitely had something to do with it. But he said, I do consider English in many ways a South Asian language. He pointed out that it was worth noting that India had the third largest English-speaking population in the world after the U.S. and the U.K. and, and that people wrote in English because all their training was in English. And uh, I read those quotes that I had, and as I said about mismatching this, but uh, he said that he grew up speaking English and Urdu and assumed that cosmopolitanism was the, was the way to be. There are three cultures, Hindu, Muslim, and, and Western, he said, were a part of his mental and emotional makeup. He could write a poem using a Greek myth, a Muslim myth, a Hindu myth, and each would be in aid to him. His poetry is a combination of personal, political, historical, and cultural elements. The personal elements particularly caught up in elements of myth and culture. With each book, he pushed himself more 
in aesthetic, formal, and thematic terms. His poetic themes defined in his words by a sensibility informed by a sense of loss, whether in an engagement with language, landscape, history, myth, and legend. In all of them, there is this overriding sense of the evanescent, the vanishing. And he said that that's what he supposed inspired him most to write. It was always, uh, he pointed out, a part of his sensibility and temperament that he saw everything in a very elegiac way. It's not something morbid, he said, but it was a part of his emotional coloring. And it is, of course, I think noteworthy that an early formative influence, T.S. Eliot, uh, whom we can hear in, in his Half Inch Himalayas, was the focus of his doctoral dissertation. So Eliot's death imagery particularly intensified what was already embedded in Shahid's sensibility from early childhood. And uh, I mean, he just talked about it because if you met him, you would be very, very surprised because he was full of laughter, always ready to joke and, and so on. But uh, he said that it was a certain way of feeling the world that he had since he was a child. And, and that he was uh, at that, you know, when I was growing up, obsessed with people vanishing and, and, and things, things vanishing, but not as something that was sort of morbid. Among the many kinds of losses Shahid <coughs> felt, among the many kinds of losses Shahid felt, those stemming from social and political injustice moved him. I've always been moved by injustice ever since I was a kid. I remember my parents discussing Lumumba, the Rosenberg Nazi atrocities, events like the Armenian massacre bring out a rage in me. History triggered into memory by literary moments, uh, evidenced in the epigraph from Oscar Wilde in the Dhaka Gauzes and in the reference to King Lear and Cordelia in after seeing Kozintsev's King Lear in Delhi illuminate his uh, political uh, concerns. The Dhaka Gauzes, one of Shahid's most popular poems, is inspired by a reference to the Dhaka muslin in the picture of Dorian Gray. For a whole year, he sought to accumulate <coughs> the most exquisite Dhaka gauzes. The Dhaka muslin, a very fine cotton that used to be made in Dhaka, the capital of Eastern Bengal and colonial India, and now the capital of Bangladesh, is described in the following lines. Those transparent Dhaka gauzes known as woven air, running water, evening dew, a dead art now, dead over 100 years. At his readings, Shahid would explain the background of the poem by sharing some historical facts with his audience, that the Dhaka muslin was highly coveted in the courts of Europe, and that Pocahontas, the Virginian Native American daughter of a chief, wore a dress made of Dhaka muslin at the court of King James I. Explaining that colonial Britain destroyed this handloom industry, amputating the thumbs of weavers as a deterrent to promote the textile mills in England, he quoted William Bentick, the Viceroy of India, who in 1834 said that, quote, the bones of the cotton weavers are bleaching the plains of India. Shahid clarified in, that in setting out to write this poem, he did not have an overt political agenda to represent what the British did. What engaged uh, him, as he says, me, was a horrible act, but only as it was passed down to us, thus becoming legend and tied up with family history and my grandmother. So uh, after seeing Kuzintsev's King Lear in Delhi, the poem begins as the speaker steps out of the theater into the streets of Delhi. The first two lines of the poem, Lear cries out, you are men of stones, as Cordelia hangs from a broken wall. 
And this is uh, historically documented. Significantly, the theater location, Chandni Chok, one of the most famous parts of Old <coughs> Delhi, serves to transport the speaker from King Lear's dramatic tragedy to a historical one. The humiliation and exile of Zafar, who was also a famous poet. <coughs> I think of Zafar, poet and emperor, being led through this street by British soldiers to his feet in chains to watch his son's hand. One of Shahid's signature poems is called Dhaka Gauzes, referring both to the capital of Bangladesh and the weaving industry in India, which the British commandeered during colonialism. The Dhaka Gauzes are also a metaphor for a lost world, where silks were so finely woven they could be pulled through a wedding ring. As he can no longer read because of his illness, Shahid recites the poem from memory. Those transparent Dhaka gauzes, known as woven air, running water, evening dew, a dead art now, dead over a hundred years. No one now knows, my grandmother says, what it was to wear or touch that cloth. She wore it once, an heirloom sari from her mother's diary, proved genuine when it was pulled all six yards through a ring. Years later when it tore, many handkerchiefs embroidered with gold thread paisleys were distributed among the nieces and daughters-in-law, those two now lost. In history we learned the hands of weavers were amputated the looms of Bengal silenced and the cotton shipped raw by the British to England. History of little use to her, my grandmother just says how the muslins of today seem so coarse and that only in autumn, should one wake up at dawn to pray, can one feel that same texture again. One morning, she says, the air was dew starched. She pulled it absently through her ring. Okay, uh, the Half Inch Himalaya, Shahid's first full length book from which the above two poems were taken, was rejected in earlier versions. He was glad because it was marked quite there. And uh, he used to say a long time went into uh, shaping it. And Wesleyan took it in December of 1985. It was published in 87. So uh, it had already been a finalist in some of the national competitions. Uh, he said that he was glad because it, it got accepted when it was aesthetically ready. Uh, he also wrote seemingly lighter poems that had a dark edge at the same time. Alongside the Dhaka gauzes and the other poems in the half inch, there are what we might consider humorous poems, such as the telephone poems and Red Riding Hood in his chapbook, A Walk Through the Yellow uh, Pages. And this one, um, I like, so I will read a little bit to you from this. So this is called, you know, the Bell, Bell Telephone Hours. And uh, so this one is, today talk is cheap, calls somebody. These are those ads from uh, what is now AT&T, but it used to be Bell Telephone, I think, from the time maybe your parents, or I don't know, grandparents, I think in the, in the 70s or 80s. Uh, so this is, uh, <clears throat> reach out and touch someone far away. I called information desk heaven and asked, when is doomsday? I was put on hold. <laughs> Through the hallelujahs of seraphs, I heard the idle gossip of angels, their wings beating rumors of rewards in heaven. Then I heard flames, wings burning, then only hallelujahs. <clears throat> I prayed, angel of love, please pick up the phone. But it was the angel of death. I said, tell me, tell me, when is doomsday? He answered, 
God is busy. He never answers the living. He has no answers for the dead. Don't ever call again, collect. <laughs> um, so, uh, to, to quote Shahid, uh, no one would think the poems, uh, the Dhaka gauzes, and the telephone poems were are written by the same person, but he said, such is the mysterious business of temperaments about, uh, about the fact that he wrote this. The poems in his uh, second book, A Nostalgist Map of America, to a greater degree than the half inch transcend the personal into the more universal. And uh, this is evident, for example, in the central section of A Nostalgist Map of America, which re recollects the death of Shahid's friend from AIDS. Shahid commented, it had quite an effect on me that someone who had become a part of the ghostly patterns of the past suddenly came back into my life and died more vividly. It's not just the death of a friend, a simple elegy, but the death of tribes, the death of landscapes, and the death of a language. All of these things happen simultaneously to create a density. And of course, a universe dies with every person's death. Uh, he, he, I mean, you know, America is beautiful and many places are especially beautiful, but he went to Arizona actually to do his University of Tucson to do, I mean, University of Arizona Tucson to do his MFA. Uh, and uh, when he went to Arizona, he, he said, quote, I suddenly found a landscape that could somehow bear my concerns and my themes of exile, loss, and nostalgia, some of my political concerns too. And of course, you all know Arizona has the Grand Canyon and so on. But the, so there's nostalgia in the poems. There's, there's uh, about Native American tribes uh, and uh, who have uh, vanished. But again, it's a homesickness for what is gone, what has vanished. And, uh, uh, as Lawrence Needham notes, Shahid reclaims the voices of life's victims in painful awareness of the enormity, even futility, of his task. So, uh, all these things became metaphors, especially the fact that uh, the southwestern desert, I don't know, 200 million years ago, was, uh, was uh, an ocean. And so these things became metaphors for Shahid in a nostalgic map of America, where the subject matter with Emily Dickinson's evanescence, visible constantly, ranges from the Papagos and the sacred Suaros to Medusa and the youngest of the Grai and to the legend of Lala and Majnu. The prologue poem Eurydice Is, 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 uh, is uh, written from Eurydice's point of view. Uh, so the, the poem uh, transposes the Greek myth to the Bergen-Belsen uh, Nazi camp. This is, by the way, Kashmir. I'll come back to this. Uh, So uh, I'll just read these two quotes. I was so interested in the idea of Eurydice, and I wanted to do a poem from her point of view. So a number of things came together, and to me, the most modern image of hell was the Nazi camp. And I just said, that is hell. And so in trying to modernize the myth, a lot of my politics in its own way came to the surface. So this is from an interview. I said, everything we hear about the legend is from Orpheus's point of view, that is, he is lonely on earth, he has lost her, and I said, this poor woman had one chance to get out of hell, and he screwed it up. So, uh, so I just want to share this two sentences. What started the poem was that he had read a marvelous poem by Adrian Rich 
I Dream I'm the Death of Orpheus, uh, in which she, she took the images from Jean Cocteau's film Orphe. So uh, he says it's a startlingly incredible poem, and he also had his first stirrings of feminism uh, in, this, in this poem. And talking of Greek myth, uh, he did a poem uh, on, uh, on Medusa, which is also in the nostalgist map of America. Uh, and he says this, I did a poem in the voice of a woman in the voice of Medusa. This poem, I think, was a gift, literally a gift almost in the divine sense because I was staying somewhere and I was woken up by some sound at two in the morning and this phrase, this line came to me, I must be beautiful. And I said, go away, line, I want to sleep. But it didn't let go, and I got up, and I ended up doing 16 drafts of this poem by the time morning came. And within six hours, this poem was written. And it's very close to what you call the divine inspiration. So I just wanted to share, uh, share that with you. How do we for time? I said I won't finish. I just want to make sure. Sorry. It's uh, about um, 7.38. Oh, okay, so not that. So uh, uh, one more thing. Uh, his sense of heritage, one, one thing he was asked about being in America, and he said that he translated Faz Ahmed Faz from the Urdu, uh, his ghazals, into English, and he said that his sense of heritage had in fact sharp, was sharpened in America in a strange way because he said if he had, he had been in India, he probably wouldn't have thought of translating that. And uh, uh, so I just quote a little bit from him. I've recovered my roots in a stronger way as a South Asian, as an Indian, and as a Kashmiri. For example, translating Faz Ahmed Faz uh, is something that occurred to me in the US. This is a poet that all of the subcontinent, as in India and Pakistan, are, uh, you know, they quote, them, quote, quote this poet all the time. He said, I really think I became a poet in America where I realized myself in formal, aesthetic, and artistic terms, became a poet I could respect, and found my voice, my manner, my courage, my formal degree of virtuosity. Shaped by both English and Urdu, his poetry reveals his love of both languages. Um, he said his loyalties to both have political, cultural, and aesthetic implications that have led not to confusion but to a strange, arresting clarity. He said, I think the sensibility of, his, of my poems is very much the sensibility of someone who grew up with a lot of Urdu poetry being recited around him. I think I grew up with it in my bones. And I think if you read my poems carefully enough, you see the sensibility and the music, if you will, of the lines is not akin to the music of American English or British English. I think one should be able to detect the music of Urdu, the Urdu language, behind my English. He brought both the rhythms and music of Urdu poetry into the ghazal, an Arabic, Persian, and Urdu lyric in couplet form. Enhancing American understanding of the ghazal is seen by some as his major contribution to poetry and perhaps his lasting legacy. It was his genius, Christopher Merrill writes, to fuse the English and Urdu literary traditions. He knew Paradise Lost as intimately as the Quran. He was inspired alike by Dante and Faz Ahmed Fares, and he devoted his last years to reshaping our literary landscape, convincing more than 100 American poets to write real ghazals in English. 
With these ghazals anthologized in ravishing disunities, real ghazals in English, Shahid ensured that the actual form of the ghazal found its way into American poetry. He also completed his own book of ghazals in English, Call Me Ishmael Tonight, which was published posthumously. So I just have to show you. A year ago, I was at the Charlotte airport waiting for a plane and I had a six, over, six hour delay. I ordered a scotch and, uh, at the chairs bar and uh, this person said, the waitress said, uh, well, for a dollar bill, you can have a double. So I said, sure, get me a double. And well, before the evening was over, I had four or five doubles. And then this line kept coming to me, Arabic of it, Arabic of it all. So my first couplet was, I say that, after all, is the trick of it all when suddenly you say Arabic of it all. Because you the scream of it all is the refrain, it is the rhyme preceding it. Are you with me? <laughs> <laughs> I say that, after all, is the trick of it all when suddenly you say Arabic of it all. Now, one of the most painful things for me in America is when somebody invites me for dinner and gives me Indian food. <laughs> because invariably the food is very yellow. It's always yellow, yellow, yellow. <laughs> so, and while I'm sitting there painfully and politely digesting the food, the husband's telling his wife, great curry, honey, great curry. So, <laughs> white men across the U.S. love their wives' curry. I say, oh no, to the turmeric of it all. <laughs> You see, you're allowed in the scheme to be funny in one couplet and talk about God in another and about religion in another and politics in another. My, and the last couplet, you can invoke your own name. So my last, there are many couplets, I won't go through all of them, but the last couplet was, For Shahid to the night went quickly as it came. After that, oh friend, came the music of it all. So I'll do another example for you. What will suffice for a true love not? Even the rain, but he has bought griefs, lotted, bought even the rain. Even the rain is the refrain, bought it. Uh, before that, uh, you know, he, um, this is uh, actually a quote from him. The ghazal, for those of you who don't know, in its canonical Persian form, arrived at in the 11th century, is composed of autonomous or semi-autonomous couplets that are united by a strict scheme of rhyme, refrain, and line length. The opening couplet set up the scheme by having it in both lines, and then the scheme occurs only in the second line of every succeeding couplet. That is the first line of every succeeding couplet sets up a suspense. And the second line delivers on that sus sus suspense by amplifying, dramatizing, imploding, exploding. So uh, I just wanted to uh, very quickly say this before I end. Uh, many scholars who write about his poetry focus on exile, uh, his exile. And one of the things I just wanted to say was that he used the term exile, and that's what he said, for its emotional resonance, preferring it to what he called the near clinical emigre or expatriate. But you know, he, he always said it was not that he was kicked out of anywhere, right? He just thought, and, but, but this is a quote from him, temperamentally I would say I'm an exile. The ability to inhabit several circumstances several historical and national backgrounds simultaneously makes up the exilic temperament a lot 
especially of this past century and this continuing new century. And I think that, oh, so he had an intellectual cosmopolitan upbringing, and this is a quote. When I was a kid, I remember telling my parents that I wanted to build a little Hindu temple in my room, and they said, sure. And then once I said I wanted to build a Catholic chapel with pictures of Jesus, and they said, sure, they brought me statues of Jesus, they brought me statues of Krishna. They said, go ahead, build your temple. It was a wonderful atmosphere full of possibilities of self-expression. And I will stop there. An image of Kashmir, by the way, that, uh, yeah. Great, thanks, Anna, that's beautiful. Uh, we have time for questions. Yeah. Yes. Hannah, yes. you obviously knew Shahed um, all his life. Yeah. And you were an expert on his poetry even before you began your sabbatical project. So, what I'm wondering is whether your sabbatical project changed any of your perspectives on his poetry or changed something about the way that you looked at some of his work. And I, I realize that this could be a very long answer, but don't give me a very long answer. No, no, I won't give you a long answer. No, it's, it's true. Let me tell you two things. Well, one thing that... <coughs> He never talked about uh, exile, and he, he uh, never talked about uh, post-colonial mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. And I, what I noticed was that it's only after he came to America that he talked about exile and he talked about post-colonial. And by the way, even though that's my discipline, Shahid was not uh, in love with the word post-colonial. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, yeah. He, and one of his main uh, reasons was that he said, you know, explain to me what it means. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think uh, some of us already know, if not all of us, that it was the very term post-colonial in many ways, the way we use it in English academia was created here mm -hmm. in the United mm -hmm. States. And then it was exported to India. So, so that, I, that was something that I became very, very uh, aware of in his writing, but I had mm -hmm. really not, not examined his work mm -hmm. in any formal scholarly way. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's one. And, and uh, of course, I also had to look at his diaries. And uh, I just became more aware that Exile was just not a, a, a thing that he considered. It's later only after coming to America that uh, he talks about it. Even though, even though, again, as he said, it's for, for the so-called emotional resonance, as he said, mm -hmm. because he was equally comfortable here as in India or anywhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. How is he what? Well, after he died, as I said, he's owned as a poet of India, but he was, uh, he, he was, uh, it's where something about India, you know, once you have been acknowledged in the West, at least that's what I think, uh, uh, that is, uh, whether it's England or America or wherever, then India will also recognize or acknowledge you in some ways. In other words, now you can argue with me and say no, but, but that's true. It's that is one Shahid was recognized here. Okay, so is he part of the American Jewelry Canon? Say that again? Is he part of the American Jewelry Canon? Is he part of the American? Literary Canon. Well, uh, I think so. Uh, but uh, you know, there are poets who will agree or not agree, but I think so. And uh, now he's been, like in Kashmir, he's called the voice of Kashmir, even though he actually said he did not 
think that that was uh, something that, that he could call himself because he did not write. He wrote only in English. He wrote only in English, so he said that he didn't think he was. Uh, for him, it was the important thing was always to write uh, a good, uh, you know, to write a good to write a good poem. And in fact, there's just one quote that I want uh, to. Uh, and it was, forgive me. The aesthetics inform one uh, why he did not think about. Uh, I apologize because I have not. Yeah. This is the thing that he emphasized again and again and again. Subject matter, these are quotes from him. Subject matter is artistically interesting only when through form it has become content. My commitment is always to the aesthetic first. I mean, I want it to be a really good poem. I don't want somebody to congratulate me for having good ideas. You know, that was his issue with, uh, with, uh, with po the post-colonial, in other words, uh, uh, yeah. So in answer to your question, is that, did I answer it? Yes? I was wondering about the merit of the poem to get it translated. I know sometimes there's like certain nuances about each language that's hard to translate from, especially poetry, to another language. And you said that some of your poems were translated to Italian, I think. Yeah, you know what, I can't, I can't speak to that, but I know I have read him on his, uh, what he says. He says, look, he starts off by, the, by stating his premise, which is that you cannot translate. In other words, translation is not possible, but then what's the next best thing you can do? Because, uh, you know, Adrian Rich and others have translated the Urdu ghazal into English, as have some other American poets, Naomi Lazard, and, and he, he really respects, uh, you know, thought her translations were very good. But, but uh, I cannot talk about his poetry that has been translated. Uh, sorry, but uh, I don't know Italian or Hebrew. Yes? Uh, what's one of your favorite poems that you could? Say that again? What, uh, what are your favorite poems that you've written? What are my favorite? Well, what's one of your favorite that, that he's written? I tell you, I um, like stationery. Uh, he always used to say it's a crowd pleaser, and uh, you know the world is full of paper. Right to me, uh, I, I like Dhaka Bazes, and there's one poem of his called Postcard from Kashmir, which is the signature poem, the very first poem in the book Half Inch Himalayas. Uh, and his canzones are uh, his one canzone, the second of his canzones is Lennox Hill, which is uh, I think a lovely poem, but. It is very powerful and, and serious. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Yes? Uh, you said that uh, English is uh, like a South American or a South Asian uh, language. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Okay, well, well, first of all, if you know that India was under British colonial rule and that, you know, India is after the US and, and, and the UK, India has, and, and by the way, India has the greatest, in terms of numbers, the, the most um, numbers in, in publications in English, the newspapers, journals, language, I'm not making it up, you can look it up on Google. So because of British colonial rule, English is, I would say, in that sense, uh, and a South Asian language in the sense that it is spoken by, and of course, you know, there's Australian English, there is American English, and there is uh, Indian English, and so on. So it is spoken, India has a population of a billion and more, but I think English is spoken by at least 300 million, I'm guessing. So in that sense, it is. And if you were to read, I don't know if you have read a newspaper in England, but if you read a British newspaper, you will see that it's not quite, you know, the same as the English that you would see in an American. Uh, you know, it's not that it's full of colloquialisms. Oh, wow. 
but uh, so similarly, Indian Indian English is uh, is uh, English in its own right. Yes. Uh, it was just curious by the title that you mentioned. Call me Ishmael tonight. Okay. It's from Moby Dick. The Call me Ishmael tonight. I was wondering if it reflected either of Melville or, uh, or the, uh, the uh, Old or New Testament writings, which had. Uh, well, you know his poetry. I think you need um, uh, to not just know history, but uh, but your literature and the Bible and uh, Shakespeare and so on. I mean, you know, there are many allusions that to in, in you find to literature and so on, but definitely that uh, it's from uh, his ghazal uh, called Tonight. Uh, and I had, had thought about including it, but I didn't. It's uh, uh, one of his ghazals, yeah. The last, uh, the last line says, uh, God sobs in my arms. Call me Ishmael tonight. That's how it ends, the ghazal. Yes. Why is he called the beloved witness? That was the title of your presentation. Yes. Uh, in uh, another of his ghazals, uh, is uh, that, okay, in, in the ghazal, the last line is called, or the last couplet, each couplet is autonomous in a ghazal. The, the, the refrain and the rhyme is very, very strict, but, but you know, it can be uh, you know, like a gem as he described in, in a necklace, you know, a separate gem. So the last couplet is called the signature couplet where not not exactly like an artist writing their name under their painting, but you invoke the other, uh, the poet invokes his or her name, but it is not an autobiographical thing. You know, it is something that is in the poem. So you are not, I mean, so if, you are, if you are familiar with the ghazal and grown up with it, you will understand that, uh, that if, so, so in that particular ghazal, in that particular poem, uh, it ends with, uh, they ask me to tell them what shahid means, and it ends with, listen, listen. It means the beloved, it means uh, the beloved in Arabic, it, it means the witness in Persian the witness in Persian, the beloved in Arabic. So uh, the word, the word, I mean, the name Shahid has, uh, in Arabic it means this witness, and in Persian it means that. So that's where it comes from. And I have to say that I, uh, as you can see at the very beginning, this is the, also the title of his, but I had thought about it even a, you know, a long time before, before Hamilton College. Uh, used it, you know. So I didn't quite steal it from them, but uh, I had this uh, a long time ago. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Did, did he ever write sonnets and traditional English forms? You know, he has. Okay. He, he, and I will, you know, with poets here, I bow to all the poets here, I will not even pretend to. Uh, I mean, I mentioned suffix, but frankly, I, you know, to be able to tell you what exactly goes into it, I, it will be difficult for me. He wrote, you know, uh, the Villanelle, for example, yeah. and I think every form that you can think of in English, and he found it very liberating, because at some point, the free verse became uh, difficult, on the one hand, it was became easy, but on the other hand, it was it became very challenging, and for, he for, for, found forms to be more liberating. I mean, one of the major major uh, uh, impacts on his poetry is James Merrill. 
when uh, when Shahid uh, was working on the country without a post office. Kashmir has had uh, a politically troubled uh, history and it still continues to be very troubled and that's where I come from. And when he was working on the country without a post office, uh, no mail was delivered for six months at least. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is actually true what I'm going to tell you. The, uh, a friend of ours went to the post office and mail was strewn all over the floor of the post office. It was open, you could just walk in. And, and this friend found a letter with my dad's uh, name and address on, and he picked it up. So that's where the title, The Country Without a Post Office comes from. But when he was writing, uh, he said uh, that, that James Merrill is, in, in, is behind the spirit of that entire book of poems because he did not want to make the subject, you know, take advantage of the emotional convenience that it could offer. So he worked very, very hard on um, uh, on that on the poems in the country without a post office. Um, so that it somewhat. Yeah. Could you read one more poem? <laughs> <laughs> Postcard from Kashmir. And you know what? If you like it. Um, This is because you know I didn't bring the books, so from memory it will be difficult. But I think what we can do is is it on the poetry foundation? It's on Google. Website? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and actually, um, if I know how to, I am so sorry, everybody, because you know what? If if this is the first time you are doing a power presentation, you will appreciate my being so challenged about. <laughs> synchronizing that, but I can tell you, uh, um, sorry. You try it once more so you can see it at the back. Okay, so this is Postcard from Kashmir, which is the signature uh, poem in the Half Inch Himalayas. Kashmir shrinks into my mailbox. My home a neat four by six inches. I always loved neatness. Now I hold the half inch Himalayas in my hand. This is home, and this the closest I'll ever be to home. When I return, the colors won't be so brilliant. The Jalem's water so clean, so ultramarine. My love so overexposed. And my memory will be a little out of focus. In it, a giant negative black and white, still undeveloped. By the way, Jhelum is the river that runs through the city of Kashmir, which is the, which is what I explained that the tsunami-like flood that happened. Imagine if you're from St. Louis and the Missouri, or which is the river that flows through St. Louis. Sorry. Imagine that there's suddenly like a 30-foot water thing and, and it's all inundated, that's what happened. And the Jhelum is that river that flows through it. So yeah, that's a postcard from, from Kashmir. He, he, the, his third canzone uh, is called The Veiled Suite, which he, that's the, that's the last thing he wrote before he died. 
uh, which is the third of the can zones after after Lennox Hill. Uh, um, Betsy wrote a guzzle. You tried a couple anti-war guzzles back yeah, in yeah. 2003. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Really. Um, thank you.